Our final speaker is Azra Haseki, and she will be presenting Exploring the Origins of Life, the Role of UV Light in Prebiotic Chemistry. How did life first start? That's a question that we've been asking ourselves maybe since we've known that we are alive. Well, we have a couple of different models for how life started on Earth. And mainly, they all involve a lot of different biological molecules forming, and then eventually coming together to react, polymerize, and therefore form the basis of life. But all of these models are very dependent on the conditions on Earth before life formed, so conditions on prebiotic Earth. And in order to understand these conditions, a very important factor to consider is UV light. Now, you may be saying, I have to put on sunscreen to protect myself from the UV. UV light is not good for life. But thinking of life as it is today and life as it is while it was first forming is not necessarily a correct case. In addition, UV light is very interesting to study for a couple of reasons. Firstly, we know that it was very abundant on the early Earth. And it can do very exciting things to molecules. It can excite electrons, it can break molecular bonds, and it can uh, provide the energy for chemical reactions to proceed that wouldn't otherwise happen. Also, we have very strong experimental evidence that the nuclear bases life uses today, like ribouridine, ribocytidine, the concentration of these is amplified under UV light. Uh, and this makes it more probable, because they would have a higher concentration, for them to come together, react, polymerize, and therefore uh, engage in a pathway that would lead to the formation of life. So previous work has characterized the UV output of the young sun. We know it had a much uh, greater fractional UV output, and we know how it travels through, traveled through the atmosphere, because the Earth's, early Earth's atmosphere didn't have appreciable oxygen in it, um, which is one of the main shielding factors for UV today. And what our work focused on was how UV travels through the waters of the prebiotic Earth. Since life today requires water, it makes sense to think that it evolved there. So when light travels through any medium, some of it gets scattered and some of it gets absorbed. And the amount that gets transmitted is uh, dependent on a couple of things. Firstly, how much depth of this medium it's going through. Then the medium itself, and that is expressed through the molar absorptivity constant. And then how concentrated is this medium? So how do we construct a prebiotic ocean? Well, first, we have data for the molar absorptivities of the ions that we know were in it. Um, and you can see here that uh, this is the molar absorptivity, and that's dependent also on the wavelength of the light. UV light is very high in energy. It's between 200 and 400 nanometers. Um, and then we have to factor in the concentrations of those ions in the ocean. Um, so we factor in the concentrations, and we get this graph here. And then we can assume a depth at which we want to examine. So how much of this energy did we have at the depth? Um, so we have the absorbance. And from there, we can go to the transmittance, which is how much of that energy was available. So the lower bound of absorbance for any aqueous solution is pure water itself. And that's what we started off with, um, modeling the absorbance of pure water. And we found that pure water was almost completely UV transparent up to over 10 meters. Now, this was something that had been misconstrued in the past and therefore important to note. Once we'd established that, we moved on to modeling the uh, modern abiotic, so the modern ocean without organics, and the prebiotic ocean. Um, we have data for um, the ions that were present in these oceans, and you can see that they're quite different, some of them. Uh, you might ask what that is, and it's mainly because that some of the pathways, so the sources and sinks for these ions, are dependent on life. Um, you may also ask, how do we know what's in the prebiotic ocean? No one was around to record it. Well, we have geological evidence. For example, the only way for these iron bands to form would be for there to be a large amount of ferrous iron in the prebiotic ocean. So once we have um, these ions, there was this question of, can we model the absorbance of some of these compounds that were dissolved in the prebiotic ocean as additive? How do we construct this? Uh, so generally, you can take the absorbance for a cation and an anion of a compound and just add them together, and you will get the total absorb absorbance because there won't be any significant interaction between the ions in the water. But when we model this for um, the compounds that we were interested in, iron 2 sulfate and iron 2 chloride, we found that this was not the case. Absorbance could not be modeled as additive. As you can see, um, the additive absorbance, so the blue curves, map onto the red curves. 
Uh, and the red curves are the absorbents for iron, uh, for iron only. If they were additive, they would have mapped on to this pink curve, which is the um, actual um, absorbance of the compound. So once we've done that, um, we had to model the, com the total um, UV absorbance of iron in the ocean. And to do this, we assumed that um, the iron would be present in its compound forms according to the relevant um, concentrations of chloride and sulfate in the ocean. Since there was so much more chloride than sulfate, iron to chloride was the dominant factor. Once we'd modeled all of uh, the prebiotic ocean without organics, we had to account for the fact that there probably was some organic material in the prebiotic ocean. We are, after all, investigating a pathway for life, and therefore we do need some um, organics. So when would the absorbance from these types of materials become significant? We found that it was between 10 and 100 micromolar concentration. So we can see here um, that the prebiotic ocean was more absorbent than the model o o ocean. And it was UV transmittant up to 10 meters. So what does this mean? Well, if your pathway for the evolution of life requires UV light, then the ocean would not be a good place for this to happen. Because any, all of your reactions have to be in the first 10 meters. And any molecules forming there would then likely dissipate through the thousands of meters of the ocean, resulting in very low concentrations, and therefore a very low likelihood that they would engage in pathways um, relating to life. However, if UV light wasn't required for the formation of life, then the oceans would be a good place for this to happen because anything under 10 meters would be shielded from the adverse effects of UV light. We then moved into modeling a prebiotic lake. Now, modern lakes are very diverse in their composition, and we believe that prebiotic lakes were as well. But we, in order to get a lower bound, we modeled a very base prebiotic lake, so with pure water and only the ions that we know inevitably to have been there. And what we found, that uh, this prebiotic lake was less absorbent than the prebiotic ocean. Uh, it was also up to 80% transmittant at one meter. And this was in contradiction uh, to the findings of Pierce et al. Now, Pierce et al. has uh, have a uh, RNA polymerization uh, pathway for the um, formation of life that depends on this. Uh, and we find that the composition um, the UV absorbance of prebiotic lakes is in fact very diverse. So 95% UV absorbance cannot be automatically assumed. If a pathway is going to depend on this type of absorbance, then a specific ion that would absorb UV light must be invoked, and this will have its own uh, prebiotic and biological consequences to that pathway. So in order to sum up, the work we did was to model the uh, UV absorbance of the prebiotic ocean the modern the abiotic ocean, and a prebiotic lake. And this work is available. Also, we found that the prebiotic ocean would be a good place for life to start if UV light was not required for the relevant pathway. Uh, and the UV absorbance of prebiotic lakes was diverse, and any pathway that would proceed in lakes should be regarded um, with that lake's specific composition uh, and the implications that would have for the pathway. Further work that we would like to do is the construction of this prebiotic seawater in a lab and its uh, spectroscopy. Um, and we assumed um, iron equipartitioning according to the relevant concentrations of sulfate uh, and chloride in the prebiotic ocean. A more accurate uh, estimation could be reached by using the stability constants for this compound instead. Also, we said that absorbance from organics would become uh, significant between 10 and 100 micromolar concentration. So looking into the likely concentration of organics in prebiotic water um, would be a um, good avenue to proceed in. I'd like to thank a couple of people. Uh, firstly, my mentor, Dr. Sukrit Ranjan, for his um, amazing help during this um, work in proposing um, the problem, uh, Jenny for her amazing tutorship, and these people for um, both helping me both during the paper and the presentation process, my sponsors, and of course, RSI, MIT, and CE for hosting us, and all of you for staying alive <laughs> during the presentation. We will now take questions from the judges. So this increase in absorption, I guess, it 
reduces the volume where your prebiotic or your potential life forming reactions can be happening and so it decreases the chances. Is that the idea behind modeling this um, and saying that with this absorption there couldn't be formation of life or there's less chances of it? Is that um, the mechanism? That, that's a great question. So the question is about um, what does, um, how much transmittance you have, say, for the um, prebiotic pathway. Uh, so that's exactly what we're trying to model with this project. Um, in order to um, evaluate the feasibility of different origin of life pathways, it's important to understand um, the environment in which that uh, could have happened. So uh, we're not saying that UV light was necessary for the origin of life or that it wasn't necessary. Um, what we were able to characterize was that if it is necessary, um, then the ocean wouldn't be a good place for it to happen just because of its characteristics. Um, and if it isn't necessary, then that would be viable. So we've, um, what we've been able to achieve is not to say whether UV light is um, relevant, but to say what its effect would be if it were. Okay, so just I wanted to suss out though. So uh, your results of the absorption being larger, I mean, obviously stuff could still react at the surface of the water, right? Mm -hmm. So how much does it restrict the sort of potential reaction volume, this increased absorption? So we found that the prebiotic ocean was, um, so at 10 meters, there would be like 10% transmittance at that point. So the relevant um, energy we were talking about would be the first 10 meters. And um, if we were considering an ocean, then that's thousands of meters. So anything forming in that first topmost layer would dissipate through the ocean. And that low of a concentration means that any pathway um, wouldn't, most likely wouldn't be able to proceed there. But following up on exactly that, so you're assuming that it's deep all over the place, but I'm assuming that the moon was there before life was formed, correct? It was still around. So there were tides, mm -hmm. right? So the ocean, so there are going to be large bits of coastline or what have you, I, I, unless everything's water, but if there's any land, you're going to have tidal areas where there's going to be very shallow ocean water that's kind of getting trapped and potentially mm -hmm. leaving behind some of the the biotic uh, the pro, the um, organic molecules and things like that. So I'm just wondering if you throw in sort of that geology and geometry, does that change it? Uh, that's a great question. So the question is about um, how would there were tides presumably before um, life began? So there were also shallow areas. How would that affect um, any relevant pathway? Um, speaking for the entire, so this um, ocean absorbance is yes, mainly for um, very the open ocean. yes, the open ocean, um, and I'm not sure if in tidal areas, if any uh, molecules forming would be washed out or if they would stay there. Um, that would, I presume, be dependent on um, the ocean circulation. However, um, there is work uh, on, especially in um, ponds that have wet dry cycles, um, and tides also have the same thing, where there is a wet phase and then a dry phase. Uh, that is, in fact, uh, known to facilitate polymerization. Uh, because with decreased um, water activity, you have a much higher chance of uh, things polymerizing. Uh, so that is a very relevant um, factor to consider in future work. Uh, um, how dependent is your modeling result here on the concentrations in the ocean? You know, you know what was there from mm -hmm. the geology, but I don't know how much the geology gives you exactly what the concentrations would look like. Do you, can you give it? Um, also a very relevant question. Um, how dependent is our ocean model on the concentration of different ions in the ocean? Uh, so the geology gives us um, upper and lower bounds um, for um, the concentration. Um, for particular ions, especially iron and iodine, it is very dependent on the um, concentration. Um, however, we can do different um, simulations to, um, to determine how relevant this is. So one way we can do that is to assume that it has the lowest concentration and then assume it has the highest concentration and see how much that changes. Another way is to use Markov chains. Um, we have generally considered um, what we consider to be a likely in the middle um, 
concentration. Um, further work could look into that, but for other ions like nitrate, it wasn't that important. One more. Uh, so you were modeling some absorption by, um, I guess, polymers created by electric mm -hmm. discharge. Um, isn't that kind of the, the point, right? You want UV to be catalyzing reactions between big molecules for life to happen. Does including that in your absorption really make sense if you're modeling the likelihood of life forming um, in the ocean? Um. I think it does make a lot of, so these, uh, the specific polymers that we're modeling here is a spark discharge polymers. So polymers that form in experiments like the Miller-Urey experiment, where you assume you have water and then a methane and ammonia rich atmosphere and you spark it with energy and then all of these polymers come out. Um, the thing is that not all of these polymers are relevant to life. So you have a lot of ho uh, complex hydrocarbons, but they don't, they're not all necessarily things that you need for life. Uh, and the molecules that you do need for life are generally found in very low concentrations. However, um, they can absorb UV, and they probably did form uh, on Earth, on prebiotic Earth. That's what the experiment is about. So. All right. Thank you, Azra. Thank you.